Although the Owl House is fresh in hiatus mode, we didn't have to wait long for information pertaining to Season 2. As last week, creator and showrunner Dana Terrace decided to partake in a spontaneous Reddit AMA, ask me anything, that gave a lot of insight into the future of the series. Alongside clarifying some confusion and speculation around big plot points in Season 1, touching on the progression of Season 2, and so much more. I'm talking about what to expect in Season 2, information on Amity's parents, and teases of characters to come. Even information on how the show was made, which is always an interesting thing to learn, as every show production slightly differs from each other. So of course, we're going to run through this Q&A, interject our own speculations here and there, and break down all of the things to get hyped for. And to make it easier on you guys, who may not want to scroll through the AMA, but instead prefer someone to just narrate all the interesting bits, we have organized all the questions into four sections. Season 2, Unanswered Questions, Miscellaneous, and Behind the Scenes. And everything will be timestamped in the description. Grab the popcorn, because we're going to be here for a hot minute. Of course, spoiler warning! If you're not caught up with the Owl House, please go catch up, and then come back. Before we dive in though, we have a word from our Patreon. Quick Patreon plug! We have some fantastic people supporting us over at Patreon, including a long-term patron, Film Dreamer, a channel that discusses not animation, not film, but the ultimate comfort food for the soul, reality TV. That's right, you can find loads of content on Shark Tank, 90 Day Fiance, and even Pawn Stars. I personally find this to be a very interesting angle, and I feel as if this channel really has the potential to take off. Support smaller creators as they have supported us. Subscribe, check out a video, leave a like, and a comment. If you want to support the roundtable, consider checking us out on Patreon, where you can get access to outlines, video plans, and sometimes even early access to the videos themselves. Keep in mind, shoutouts are our $50 tier. Now back to the video. Starting with the topic of Season 2, what exactly can we expect? Oh boy, let's get ready to jump down the rabbit hole. Luna Eclipse 77 asked, without spoiling anything, what can we expect from Season 2 of The Owl House? You can be subtle. To which Dana responded, hmm, you can expect parental conflict, a lot of emotions, island exploration, and new characters. Now, parental conflict sounds like the Blight parents more than anything else, as Amity's growth is likely going to be seen as regression in the eyes of her parents. Making amends with Willow, her crush on Luz serving as an increasing distraction, her overall shift in attitude, those are all things that I think her parents may be disturbed by. Because none of that is indicative of the person they want Amity to be, not who she actually is. And now that we know the Blights were present when Edith's curse kicked in, another revelation pertaining to any history between the Blights and the Clawthorns feel kind of inevitable. Parental conflict could also involve, well, other parents, like Luce's mother, who Luce currently does not have a way to directly contact. As we learned, Luce was charging her phone and using Wi-Fi through the portal that she blew to smithereens, and is now being reconstructed by Bellows. Eventually, Luce's phone will die, even if she can still talk through her mom through data. But as it stands, I think that link is effectively severed. But hey, with an electricity glyph, I'm sure Luce can figure something out. Star Converse asked, Can you share any info about what Season 2's plot will mainly be about? To which Dana responds, All I'll say is, everything people responded to from Season 1, especially the last few episodes, there will be more of. I feel like Emperor Bellos, the Day of Unity, and the aftermath of Lilith betraying the Emperor's Coven will be put at the forefront, alongside that Ida is now taking on the role of the student as Luz teaches her a new form of magic with the glyphs. I definitely foresee both assisting each other and hoping one another crack new ways to cast spells. Of course, while that's not happening, Luz will continue her studies at Hexide and hope her friends confront their big conflicts. I definitely think her bond with Amity will have a significant presence throughout the season, albeit sprinkled in here and there, like in Season 1. We still will likely have an Amity episode here, a Bellus episode there, check in with Edith's Curse, have an episode reserved for world building as a explore more of the island. You get the idea. Season 1 already did a great job of incorporating various characters into various storylines. They do a really good job of implementing that cast, so I'm already delighted at the prospect of different character combinations going on different adventures. Don't forget things that were touched on here and there, like Willow's Laden Power, the Bat Queen's origins, and the ongoing mystery of just who the Hell King is. Next question. 
The real freak asks, will we see more of Ida and Lilith's sibling moments? To which Dana responds, hell yeah. And yeah, it makes sense that we would see more of Lilith in season two, and that her new dynamic of sharing the curse with Ida will be showcased, paving the way for them to reminisce about their childhood, the good and the bad. Swolchol asks, will we see more of Gus's story next season? To which Dana responds, we get to know everyone a little bit better in season two. Savior of Subs comes out of the woodwork with two questions. One, how would you describe Amity's parents? Are they similar to Gravity Falls' Northwest or worse? If yes, then in what ways? And two, will there be anybody's birthday during the next season, specifically Luz? Will she celebrate her quinceañera? To which Dana responds, Amity's parents appear one way, but there's a little more to them than you guys think, and that could either be good or bad for our protagonist. I especially have fun writing Mr. Blight. He's interesting. And as for the birthdays, depends on if we get a season three, to be honest. Smiling emoticon with one tear? Amity's parents clearly have a reason for their behavior and wanting to ensure the Blight's success, but their approach is all wrong. The idea of what we're missing being good or bad for the protagonist makes me wonder if that means there's a way for Willow to re-earn their approval, even though they're honestly not worth the time. They wanted Amity to dissociate from Willow because they viewed Willow as weak. Throughout season one, we've learned that clearly wasn't the case, so maybe witnessing Willow's prowess will flip their decision. Could you imagine the Blights going all, uh, actually, throw out Basha, Willow's your best friend again. And Disney, please, season three pickup, they need it, they deserve it. I wouldn't be too alarmed though, they're still working on season two. And it feels as if Disney takes more time before deciding to renew a show or not. And considering how long it takes for these episodes to actually air on television, I don't think there's any reason to be alarmed, especially with the increasing popularity of the series. Eclipse of Butterfly asks, will season two make us cry? To which Dana responds, man, I hope. Considering how emotionally charged episodes like Enchanting Grand Prix and Agony of a Witch were, I would assume as the stakes get higher, so does the emotional weight. So I guess I should just have a box of tissues off to the side, within reach, ready to ball my eyes out, whenever it seems as if a heavy episode will be on the horizon. Conk1234 asks, who is your favorite character you've created? And to go along with that, who is your least favorite character? And design, not writing or personality. To which Dana responds, my favorite character? I'm gonna go with the character I have the most fun writing. You kinda met him, but you haven't seen his face. Ugh, I love that other one too. And that other one. Oh, and that one. You've seen all of these characters in some way, but not really. But other than them, I really love Ida. Least favorite character design though. Honestly, I kind of love all our character designs. Our team is so good. The puppeteer from episode two really freaks me out though. Now, although Dana has teased multiple characters, the phrase that we've met him but haven't seen his face sounds like Bellis' closest guard, who we nod to after saying he'll keep an eye on the Owl Lady at the end of Young Blood Old Souls. It sounds like his true identity is going to be a who. Could you imagine if he's Luce's dad? Hey, could be. I still think she has family in the demon realm somehow. Other character nods could just be general hex high students we haven't met, Amity's parents, and so much more. But I really do believe she was teasing this guy in particular. Anna Maestro asks, when Luce learned the ice glyph in Adventure in the Elements, she makes a small diamond shape at the bottom of the glyph that wasn't there before. Can she other edit glyphs like this? And what is a palisman? What are they made of? How do they work? Can they use magic? Dana responds, The application of glyphs and all their uses will be explored more in Season 2. A palisman is our world's equivalent of a witch's familiar. They act as familiars and double as magical staffs that house their own source of power outside of a witch's bile sack. They're not all powerful, but they can do some cool stuff. Typically, a witch will carve their palisman from a special type of wood in their teens. This can either be done at school or with parental supervision. That is, if that precious resource is still around. I feel as if the progression of the glyphs will come from Ida getting crafty while Luce is at Hexide. Not to discredit Luce at all. I'm sure a lot of breakthroughs will come from her as well. But Ida has age, wisdom, and experience at her side. Not to mention the abundance of spare time. Now that she's cut off from Earth, she no longer can amass a supply of human materials to sell. However, this makes me wonder, what will she do for a profession now? 
can they figure out a different way of going to Earth? I.e., is it possible for glyphs to conjure up portals? As for the palisman, Dana alludes to the idea of the material for a palisman becoming rare over the years, something I could see becoming an important plot point in Season 2 or beyond. As the beginning of the series established that Luce would one day earn a staff, and thus a palisman of her own. She already has a cape, so I can see obtaining a staff being a very nice way to end Season 2 off on, in terms of Luce's progression to becoming a witch. Okay, Lee asks, will we see more of Viney, Gerbil, and Barkus? Just for context, these were Luce's fellow detention track mates in the first day. Dana answers, maybe. We were honestly not expecting all the love for these troublemakers, but we love when audiences connect to characters. Definitely incentivizes us to bring them back. Flaming Avocado asks, how are the twins after they got sued up at Grom? You think there will ever be a musical episode in the next season? Dina answers, they're salty, but they'll get over it. They'll have plenty of distractions in season two. You may not want this answer, but I deeply dislike musicals. Maybe because I was a dancer for 10 years and that experience was not fun. But I'll probably never do a musical episode in anything I make. Oh no, Dana, not the musicals! It's okay though, I guess fan animatics of Ida singing show tunes will have to do. For context of being stood up, Dana revealed through art on social media that Edric and Emera were actually stood up by their Grom dates. The cinnamon rolls got screwed over, but distractions has my mind going crazy with ideas. Distra Distractions could infer crushes, which I would hope to be upperclassmen of Hexide like them, as we haven't really seen all too many of them, and I would love to see what a junior or a senior at Hexide could do with abomination magic, or illusion magic, oracle magic, the list goes on! How have those students surpassed our main characters? Distractions could also refer to trouble with the Blight parents, as I feel the twins could easily get roped into that as well. Looper's P asks, what and when can we expect for official merchandise? And will we see other types of bird-themed houses? Like a raven house, for example. Dana responds, Man, I have no idea. Disney is historically weird with that junk. Besides, all the fan merch I've seen is so much cooler than anything Disney makes anyways. Bird-themed things are generally a clawthorn thing. Dot, dot, dot. First things first, you can find great fan merch at themysterycheck.com, not even sponsored. But also notice that Dana didn't necessarily deconfirm that we would see a another bird theme location, just that it's specific to the Clawthorn family. This has me optimistic that we could still see more of those at some point. For example, like a flashback, or the potential of ever seeing one of Ida's relatives in present day. But maybe if Lilith acquires her own home, if she doesn't go back to the Emperor, we can see something to the effect of the Raven House. Kitty Cat 113 asks, what were your inspirations for Emperor Bellows? Is King's backstory deeper than we think? Dana responds, Bellows went through a lot of back and forth and decisions. He has very specific inspirations, but those will become clear in season two. And to the question about King, she simply responds, hmm. I just want to appreciate how much care clearly went to Bellows. For those who have seen my most recent Owl House theory, you know I suspect that Bellows is a lich. The hmm for King has me holding on to his introduction. That his belief of being the King of Demons does mean something. I believe that when it comes to Bellos and the Titan, King will play a very important role in everything. PlaidLad89 asks, When Ida ran out of magic, what happened to her biosac? And why does King wear a collar? Dana responds, It's like an organ that's not producing chemicals she needs to produce magic on her own. It's still there, but it's pretty useless now. And for King, to be revealed in Season 2. Confirm King lore on the way! Now I wonder if the bio can ever be replenished. Is it possible for Ida to regain her magic? Hell, she shared a curse of her sister, but didn't get any of that lily bio magic. It makes me wonder if it can be shared or transferred at all. Kind of like a blood transfusion. Maybe that's a different spell. Just food for thought. But wrapping up what to expect in Season 2, we now move on to clarification and unanswered questions. We all can have different interpretations of plot beats, background details, you name it. Abiotic being asks, what sexuality is Amity? It's not entirely clear yet, to which Dana responds, Amity is intended to be a lesbian and Luce is bi. I apologize for my original post which was worded vaguely. Romantic threads are fun, and I love how many people are connecting to that storyline, but my personal taste as a storyteller will never allow me to write a full-on romance saga. That being said, me and the crew are having a crap ton of fun developing this thread in Season 2. All the ins and outs of these storylines we're keeping track of feels like we're knitting. Piscine Fox asks, Asking the big question here, does Amity naturally have brown hair and dyes it? Or is it green and she has brown patches in it? To which Dana responds, Amity's natural hair is brown like her father's. Emera and Edric's hair is green like their mother's. Mrs. Blight likes her children to be... 
color coordinated. Ah. Uh. So, it's confirmed. Amity's hair color was not influenced by Goo Witch Azura, a theory I really liked, but it is because of her parents more so her mother, wanting Amity to be more like her siblings physically, perhaps even mentally, as we know Amity gets more hassle from her parents than her siblings. This is kind of heartbreaking, the straight up confirmation that yeah, this character's hair, that's the result of her mother's control. Amity is a fantastic character, and that's clear just in the way that it hurts that her parents want her to be someone she's not. This next one just felt important to include, Ben Froyo Boy 1124 asks, though I haven't watched the Owl House yet, it's something I've definitely been considering for a long time. Will Owl House ever come to Disney Plus? That may be my only hope of watching it. I've been checking every day since the finale. Dana responds, Yes, the Owl House will come to Disney Plus soon. Generally, Disney Channel shows go on to Disney Plus 30 days after their finale. I don't have a solid date yet, but when I do, I'll make a post about it. Now, when it does come to Disney Plus, if you have it, please rewatch it. If you have any friends who have it, Make them watch it! I think it would be beneficial for the current Disney TVA shows to be simulcast both on TV with Disney Channel and Disney Plus, even if it's as simple as a smaller waiting period. They already have a similar deal on Hulu with FX shows, where they go up the next day after airing on TV. So I imagine it's possible the demand just needs to be there. And part of that demand would be for people to watch these shows, to watch The Owl House, Amphibia, and Big City Greens on Disney Plus consistently, show there's interest. I would just really love for people who I know want to be able to watch the show to just throw on Disney Plus, watch new episodes, and stay caught up, and not waiting over a year or longer for the seasons to finish airing on TV. That just feels so unfair and kind of nonsensical on your premium Disney service. The Moise Murphy leads us to speculation on the release date. As they ask, how long do you think the hiatus between seasons will be? And who's your favorite character in the Owl House? Dana responds, unsure. We're still animating season two. Unfortunately, COVID has definitely shifted schedules and expectations. We're doing our best. And I have many. And most haven't been formally introduced yet. But I love Ida and King. That's not to say I don't like Luce and everyone else. I tend to like the characters I have the easiest time writing. Protagonists are hard. It seems as if there's tons of characters we're going to love that are on the way. And I feel Dana on protagonists being hard to write. And with season two still being animated with COVID delays, I'm thinking we may not see season two this year. But considering Disney shows usually fall into the pattern of three to four month hiatuses, and also tending to go into hiatus for the holiday season, and season one being wrapped at the end of August, I wouldn't be surprised if season 2 premiered sometime in January 2021. That would also be the anniversary of when season 1 premiered in the same month. So hold out and remain optimistic. At the latest though, I would imagine February or March 2021, which wouldn't be that bad, going about 6-7 months without episodes. I just know those growing fan base is going to demand more sooner rather than later, and hiatuses have not been historically kind to fandoms. But especially here since the bulk of the fandom just got here. If I just got into a show and binged the entire season, knowing that it's weekly, I'd be itching for an update too. Gravity Falls fans in the house know that for Disney, this can just be business as usual. Freddy Jason fan asks, what is Hootie? Dana responds, man, the answer to that is really upsetting. Too bad it's also a secret. <laughs> Now look, Hootie is a titular character, so it makes sense there's some grand reveal behind his presence. I'm not ready to cry if they end up pulling some harsh shit on us. Like, Hootie's bound to the door, but is really some kind of cool spirit who deserves better. That Ida was able to save him, just at the cost of him being a living house. Only time will tell, I suppose. Freddy Cypher asks, Is Lilith's Palisman alive like Albert? And if Ida gets the curse cured, will her hair turn back to its natural color? Dana simply responds, Yes. And no. So I'm hoping we'll see Lilith's Palisman in Season 2, and unfortunately, Orange Cherry Eda may never return. Seems as if she'll be great forever. Not that she'd mind. And I mean, come on, it looks great on her. Emery Daughter asks, is Principal Bump controlled by the demon attached to his head, or is it more like an accessory? Do they both work together? Also, does the demon have a name? Dana responds, his name is Furin, and he has a purpose, but that's all I'll say for now. I kind of wonder if Bellows is in sync with this demon, having the capability to see everything Bump does, or if this demon bumps up, bumps his knowledge. Maybe whoever's the principal is crowned this demon on top of their head, 
head, and they're instilled with great wisdom. Only time will tell. Hot Word 14 asks, how did King get his horn chipped? Was it a fierce battle, or did he just fall down the stairs? Dana responds, all will be revealed eventually. Once again, adding on to the idea that King's origin is a lot more elaborate than we think, and that everything in his appearance matters. Annual Ad Revenue asks, I wanted to ask if Willow and Amity are starting or have started hanging out without Luz to rekindle their friendship. Dana responds, I don't think they're comfortable enough to do that just yet. Old wounds take a while to heal, but the air between them is certainly lighter than it was before. I like that they're not in friendship mode right away, though again, a confrontation with the Black Parents could make the rekindling stronger than before. Again, I'm excited to see where this goes. Psychopathic Frog asks, We've seen that Amelie's home life is less than ideal, but can you tell us anything about Basha or Skara's home lives or past? Also, both Creepy Luce and Gwendolyn have been mentioned, but we still know next to nothing about them. Could you possibly give us any new information about them? Dana responds, We haven't seen much of these characters outside of school, but I like to think that Basha's mother and Andy's mother have a tense rivalry from childhood, and they're still trying to one-up each other with the accomplishments of their children. I won't say anything about Gwendolyn, but Creepy Luce was actually a joke response to the line, Maybe I'll meet a hot yet vulnerable upperclassman from the first day. I love the evil doppelganger theory. I'm not confirming or denying that that may or may not exist, but that's what that specific term was referring to in that interview. For those out of the loop, Creepy Loose was a theory that circulated like wildfire after Luce's voice actress referred to a scene where she voiced Creepy Loose in particular and that we'd get to know her, causing many people to believe Creepy Loose was a potential doppelganger who was later responsible for sending all the letters to Luce's mom. Although I will mention that I already threw in my two cents of who wrote the letters, but yeah, that's not what Luce's voice actress was getting at. Definitely got to improvise with Creepy Luce. Yeah, yeah, Creepy Luce is Creepy Luce is, yeah, Thanks. you'll see her, you'll meet her. You'll get yeah. to know her. Keep an eye out for Creepy Luce. I made this account for Dana ask, how old is Ida, Gus, Willow, and King? Dana responds, Ida is mid to late 40s, same with Lilith, except two years older. It never felt right to give these characters exact ages unless it was somehow super relevant to the story. Gus is 12, Willow is 14, King? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. I feel as if this implies King has been alive for a very long time. Or that his age pinpoints something crucial with a mystery in the show, like the Titans. Hmm? Larky asks, did Lilith dye her hair blue? And if so, why? And what do you think about all the press the show's been getting since Enchanting Grand Fright, both positive and negative? Dana responds, yes, she absolutely dyes her hair. Once she joined the Emperor's Coven, she wanted to appear more intimidating. The press coverage has been overwhelmingly positive, and that's very encouraging for the crew to keep doing what they're doing. The negative press is equally encouraging because I live to troll jerks. And nearby stuff, I really hope I didn't butcher that. Ask, is there a specific age or age range where witches must select a coven? Dana responds, generally teens enter covens when they graduate from school, so 17, 18-ish. If they're extra talented, they may leave school and join a coven early. Now, I feel like Edric and America could be on that track, if not one of the main Hexite kids, like Willow or Gus. But that sounds like Endgame Season 3, Season 4 territory. Thoticus Maximus asks, When a witch joins a coven, are they unable to learn and cast any other type of magic that doesn't align with the coven, or can they still cast any magic, but doing so is forbidden and they'll be in trouble? If I recall correctly, there was only one person, who was later revealed as a demon, who was referred to as a wizard. Is there any differences between wizards and witches in the Boiling Isles? Dana responds, When a witch joins a coven, they are physically unable to perform any kind of magic outside of that specialty. More generic spells like levitation for small objects may be doable, but with difficulty. They're physically and magically cut off from the rest of their magical abilities. On the Boiling Isles, witch is a gender-neutral term. Wizards do exist, but it's more of a title you can call yourself if you like. There are some scrap lines that I allude to the term warlock being akin to edgelord in the demon realm. Fallout Raven asks, what is the significance of gems on Lilith and Ida's chest? Also, I saw the process of Lilith and Ida's epic battle. How long is the process of making an episode from start to finish? Dana responds, At first, there was no significance, just an in-world fashion choice. It wasn't until we were in production for The Intruder when we decided to use Ida's gem as visual aid to show when the curse was overtaking her. On the Boiling Isles, gem are as, as common in outfits as necklaces. And roughly one year, I believe, from episode premise to animation to music to foul color and all that jazz. This is why our schedules are so stacked. It can be very confusing and overwhelming. Mhaza521 asks, could you please give us some information on the relationship between Lilith and Amity? Are they pretty close? And was Lilith the one teacher that Amity referred to as mom before? Thanks. Dana responds, haha, I love this question. 
No, the mom line was not intended to be directed towards Lilith, but I love that the audience made that connection. I remember making similar connections I enjoyed as a kid. That's what makes cartoons fun. But to the actual question, honestly, Amity and Lilith are not that close. At least, I never thought of them that way. Neither of them, from my point of view, know what it's like to be particularly close with a parent, in Amity's case, or a child slash student, in Lilith's case. They are each a tool to attain each other's goals. They are both extremely pragmatic characters. At least Lilith thinks of herself that way. After convention, I imagine Amity lost a lot of respect for Lilith that day. Amity being tricked into cheating? Nightmare! This makes me curious as to how Amity and Lilith will progress in Season 2. I imagine Lilith will no longer be Amity's mentor, and if so, it may just be awkward all around. But how will Amity respond to the events of the end of Season 1? That Lilith cursed Ida. That Lilith tried hurting Luz, even if she knew Ida would come to the rescue. How will she respond to Lilith and Ida now sharing the curse? These are all things I'm dying to know. And hopefully, the show will deliver. This next comment was deleted, but we can infer it was about why Amity is so overwhelmed by her crush on Luce. Dana responds, I definitely think Luce is her first crush, or at least her first big crush. That's why it's so overwhelming. A nearby stuff asks, why is the sea of the Boiling Isles purple? Dana responds, cause it's pretty. Also, because we wanted this realm to look very different from the human realm. Bree Exo asks, why does Luz find it questionable that Amity gets all flustered around her? Does she get the signs? Or is she just really oblivious to the entire thing? Dana responds, Luz is a little bit of a bonehead. Very relatable. That being said, Luz has also been distracted with Edith's curse. It makes it hard to see what's right in front of her. And some clarity. I'm not calling Luz stupid. I actually see her as a very bright and quick thinker, but also young and still figuring life out. Something I personally related to especially at 14. In this particular situation, there's so much going on in her life, she's oblivious to some things in front of her. So, there you have it. Luz just doesn't know that Amity has a crush on her. She sucked in with other pressing matters in her life. But I think as they continue to be there for each other, even if Luz doesn't pick up on Amity's feelings, she can still develop feelings of her own towards Amity. Jumping to Miscellaneous, we're just gonna fire through these. Loyal Gal Pal asks, what's Luz's favorite anime? Dana responds, hmm, Luz's anime manga preferences? I think Luz would be into Hunter x Hunter, great choice, but never got far in the manga because Camilla would only buy her one or two bombs at a time for holidays or a good report card. Also relatable, my mom did that as well. I think she would start watching The Promise of Neverland, but would have to stop after the first season because it's just too grim for her. Very true. She definitely cried reading a secondhand copy of Children of the Sea in the public library. She'd probably love Your Name and would try to get her mother to watch it. Have I thought about this too much? Dr. Clock Stuffins ask, I just need to know. Is Hootie infinite? Can he stretch forever? Or will he eventually stop? Dana responds, There is no beginning. There is no end. There is only Hootie. Well, okay then. Chickalino asks, What's better, Jock Amity or Punk Amity? Dana responds, Perhaps Amity might attempt dressing in a punk aesthetic to impress people, but she'd never feel comfortable in those clothes. She's definitely more of a jock in my mind. Van42715 asks, What prompted you to do the Owl House series? And my second question is, will we see another loose familiar in the program? Tina responds, I pitched the general idea of an older witch with a young mentee in hell to an old writing partner who told me that no one wants to watch a show about an old lady. So I made a pitch bible out of spite. Here I am four years later. Working to success out of spite works sometimes, people. It's a good motivator. And yes, we will learn more about Luce, her mother, and her history as the series progresses. Zyrus the Healer asks, Is there anything you can tell us about the character of the Pink Stripe and her hair? The girl in Luz's flashback in the first episode. The Pink Stripe makes her seem oddly important to me. Dana responds, Ooh, fun fact! In development, Amity had a very different hairstyle. After drawing this character in the unaired on animated pilot, I decided I like this look better for the character. That's why they have a similar silhouette. So yeah, this random background character in Luz's school? A prototype for Amity. I love details like that. Hey Rebecca Rose, shout out to the homie, ask, whose idea was it to bless us with the line, talk to the glyph, which, to which Dana responds, that was a last minute punch up for me. Dana, you truly changed the world with one line. Masi Fen asks something that I just feel is important to share Dana's answer to. Do you feel slighted by your audience's obsession of Amity's crush on Luce? You put so much work into the series' plot, lore, characters, emotional impact, etc. that you must feel something about all that being put aside in favor of shipping. Sorry to ask that, I'm sure you've already had an overabundance of questions about them already. Do you have any tips for drawing and practicing anatomy? Dana responds, not at all. No, the main focus of the series will never be on any romantic thread, but that doesn't mean those threads aren't important, and I'm thrilled that people connect to our characters. 
It just means the audiences are invested, and that's a wonderful thing. World building and lore is only as important as it relates to our characters, in my opinion. A Lamo569 asks, would Ida love Vegas? I get the feeling she'd wreak havoc there. Dana responds, she's been before, she wasn't impressed. Which could be a nod towards the easter eggs that hint that Ida is the ex-wife to Grunkle Stan. We have an entire video about that you can check out. BLT Munch asks, if you could have the outhouse crossover of any other cartoon, what cartoon would it be? Dana responds, once I imagine Ida ripping Brock Sampson's mullet off with her bare hands and wearing it as a bloody wig. That'd be kind of funny. And I just put this in here because RIP Venture Brothers! Adult Swim, give them an ending! And last but not least, I'm going to include two behind the scenes questions I found very fascinating. First by Art of CB Scorch, it isn't common to see in-house animation on Western shows, so how are you able to do animations on Gravity Falls, DuckTales, and The Owl House? And you and Spencer are animated on The Owl House. Is there a limit on the number of animators you're allowed to have in-house? Dana responds, In my heart of hearts, I am an animator, and when I began on Gravity Falls, I made sure to let my supervisors know that if they ever needed freelance for special scenes, that I was available. I'm super happy I was able to do a few things. Same on DuckTales. I told them it was something I could do, and eventually I had the opportunity to do it. Animating is my favorite thing to do in the world, and I'm trying to do more in Season 2. Spencer was only our in-house animator on Season 1, actual title was Animation Supervisor. To allow for that position, I had to sit through a lot of meetings because Disney was very hesitant to bring in someone for a job that didn't perfectly fit into their overseas pipeline. But we got him in, and I'm extremely grateful for my time with them. Our in-house Season 2 animator is Kofi Fiagome. I probably butchered that name, I'm so sorry. And he's great, and I can't wait to show y'all what's being cooked up. And Sugar Sully Gliders asks, Would it be possible for someone not experienced in the industry to be able to pitch a show? Or would you need experience in the first place to have a chance? If not, any recommendations on how to get started? For The Owl House, was Amity crushing on Lou something that happened from the get-go and fans picked up on it quickly? Or did the fans influence it? Dana responds, It's not super necessary. There are no rules to entertainment. However, an effective and responsible showrunner is someone who knows the pipeline and knows how to help their crew navigate that pipeline. Experience before pitching can help you from being taken advantage of by studios. Animation moves so slowly that audiences' reactions barely have significant influence on scripts, at least how I've experienced the process. By the time our first episode aired, we were already finished writing the first season. And there you have it. There are so many more questions that I actually ended up cutting from the script just for time, but you can read everything in the link below. I don't want to take too much time on this outro. I hope this video got you hyped for season two and maybe provided some information on the animation industry. But as always, you can leave your thoughts in the comments below. And for more of our own thoughts, you can find us at either Roundtable Vids or Altric Box on Twitter and Instagram. Special thanks to Janky Bones for creating an awesome thumbnail. For more of their amazing art, you can find them on Twitter and Instagram at Bone Janky and subscribe to their YouTube channel. Links in the description. And if you enjoyed this video, please sort of like and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day. Altric Vox, signing out.